It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. What's up? What's happening? Welcome in. It's the Take Command podcast. I am Craig Hoffman. He is Logan Paulson. And joining us very shortly will be the one and only Mina Kimes from ESPN. Uh, Logan, very excited to have Mina on. Also very excited to have Dane Brugler on. Have you div- uh, dove into the beast yet? Uh, no, the, I have not. The, the but athletics I, uh, draft guide that they put out today? I have not dove into it yet, uh, but it is a it is a piece of work. You know, they have so many little tidbits. I, some of the athletes, like I remember from last year, they went back to like high school stuff, you know, like number of stars, like position switches, all that kind of stuff. So it's very, very detailed and extremely comprehensive, obviously. So, yeah. So uh, we, we're going to talk to Dane on Friday. That'll be out Monday. Uh, but very excited to have a great slew of guests. We're working on a couple more to get us uh, to the NFL draft. And then obviously plenty of coverage on who the commanders actually take. Um, but I, I wanted to talk to Mina. One, I think we'd, anybody who's got a football podcast would like to talk to Mina generally. She's obviously great at what she does. But on her show, uh, the Mina Kimes show featuring Lenny, uh, the only show that has a dog as a co-host slogan. That's a that's a neat <laughs> bit. Sometimes your dogs bark in the background, but they're just they're just uninvited they're just guests. There. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you ever have Nikki Javala on, always a risk that the dogs are going to bark. But uh, no, Lenny's an official co-host on the show. But uh, anyway, more importantly, she's doing this thing where she has guests on, and um, she does what she calls a war room mock draft. So she will give two players to the guest and have them select. And I I think what I really like about it is it simulates the pressure of being on the clock. And it's one thing for us to do like these, oh, let's flush out the hypotheticals. It's a podcast. We got nothing but time. But how does that change? And I don't think you've ever been in a war room before, but how would you imagine from talking to people that have, how that changes the pressure of the trade calls coming in? Hey, we said this, but like uh, GM or that scout really is pushing for his guy last second. How does that pressure change things? I mean, I think it's. Uh, I mean, it's obvious how it changes things, but I do think it's it's much like the the podcast that she does, right? It's it really comes down to like ultimately now you have to make the decision, right? All this time it's been hypothetical, oh this guy or that guy, but now the picks there, you're at pick two, you're at pick thirty six, pick forty, and now you got to make a decision about what guy you think is best going to fill the roster out, and so um, oftentimes it does come down to two guys and. It was interesting, uh, you know, I was talking to um, someone a couple of years ago about their process in the war room and they're like, oh, yeah, I'll review film like right before the pick just to kind of re refresh my thoughts on it, make sure he's the right guy. And, you know, I think um, Bucky Brooks and Daniel Jeremiah, they have that move the six podcast. They do such a good job as former scouts of kind of talking through the details of that process. And one of the things that comes out is just like, you know, like they're reviewing their notes and the guy's written a little bit better than somebody else. And it's down to these two guys who's a better need, who's the better cultural fit. And then I think what you find is like ultimately when people have to make the decision, they tend to be a little bit more conservative, you know? So I'm really curious to see, um, you know, like a guy like Amarius Mims, for example, like he's got all the potential in the world and it's really easy to be like, oh, you know, he's maybe the most talented offensive con- time lineman in the class. But when it's time to make the decision and pull the trigger on it, A lot of times, I think a lot of teams are going to go Graham Barton or somebody else above him, you know, just to kind of ensure that they get on base. They have a guy that's a solid double, you know, in terms of pick as opposed to the grand slam home run, but he's not going to be a strikeout. So I just think it's really interesting when when that accountability comes into it, the decision process does change pretty dramatically. So, yeah, I think of a team like the Titans at seven, who we're going to talk about with Mina, right? Um, Everyone's kind of pointing in the offensive line direction there. Joe Alt's been the pick that's mocked to everyone. But like if Bill Callahan, obviously Brian, his son, just got the the head coaching job there. The GM there has a lot of power as well. But like there's no doubt Bill Callahan's going to have a loud voice in that room. Like who are the voices that get listened to? Who, Who are the voices that can cut through? And both in position, a guy like Bill is going to want to push for an offensive lineman. Um, and also who it is. I think you have a big, like certain voices that are going to be louder than others. And I think that's something that when you're like the commanders and you're going through this for the first time as a group, that's why you, you know, as teams, I, I, I know I, we mention this every draft season, but teams do mock drafts. Mm. Teams do mock drafts. So they are prepared for situations. And I think part of that is the preparation for like, okay, how's it going to go? And we're on the clock. Like what's our operation? Like who speaks up, who doesn't, whose opinion are we soliciting and and who ultimately is Adam Peters, the ultimate decision maker going to listen to? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I do think you'll get guys who have more say more pull in the room. Like I think the Tennessee Titans example is extremely interesting because 
you know, Brian Callahan is a guy that comes from obviously Cincinnati and their success in terms of drafting Jamar Chase is going to be uh, kind of in his mind. And, you know, like he has said in multiple press conferences that they want playmakers at the position and they think playmakers can elevate the offensive line and the quarterback. And so there's going to be a really good receiver there. Maybe Malik Neighbors, probably Roma Dunze. You know, uh, Brock Barrows would be available. And do you kind of go that direction or the fact that your dad is the offensive line coach kind of pull you in the way of taking an offensive lineman? Like, I think that's so, that's such a, such, such compelling stuff. And it, and it really, again, in this, in this process that seems so analytical and so, you know, measured out and so studied, it really comes down to, these kind of interpersonal relationships. And we talk about that when it comes to evaluating players and how teams are going to value certain guys just based on personality. And then there's in the room on the day, there's guys that have more say and those guys get the guys they want usually. And so I think that's something that um, is always very fascinating. And every single front office is structured a little bit differently. And I know commanders fans are probably locked in and really curious to see how the Dan Quinn, um, uh, you know, Adam Peters scenario goes, but, um, you know, we don't have that insight yet, but it, they're all going to be a little bit different. They're all going to be weighed and measured a little bit differently. Uh, but it's always a really fun, uh, run, fun thought experiment for sure. Yeah. And then I think, you know, just to mention this too, you prepare for so many situations and then something you don't prepare for happens. And you're yeah. like, Oh, um, and I think like one of the things that I had a thought of, you know, it's, it's hard to have original thoughts at this point in the draft process. Cause you feel like you've done everything but all of a sudden last night i'm listening to mina's latest uh war room mock and brock bowers fell i think to the cowboys at 24 right and like if i'm the commanders at that point am i calling about brock bowers and going back up into the first round if, if he's like the number eight player on my board and i have a long-term need at tight end am i calling uh minnesota at 23 or whoever gets 23 in that trade uh, if minnesota trades up and, and am i like all of a sudden interested in Brock Bowers. Like there, there's things that all of a sudden, you know, your number five player on the board is available at 20 yeah. something. And you're like, do we like, yeah. I think those are the kinds of things too, that when you do enough of these mock drafts, you realize you're going to have some decisions to make that, you know, aren't so hypothetical after all. No, hundred percent. I think, you know, we, uh, we kind of did like a pseudo mock draft and getting ready for this last night. And it's, I think it's really interesting how like certain decisions just kind of, trickle down throughout the draft like you mentioned the Brock Bowers thing obviously that was on her show which is great she did it with uh Sims who's always yeah, a really Chris interesting Sims. guy to listen to but um but yeah it, it, that's that's why it's so I'm always I'm always every year I'm amazed that a team's not prepped for something but then I think about it I take a step back and think about it, I'm like it makes sense because you cannot mathematically account for every single possibility and um it, it becomes more clear as to why teams like shrink their draft boards quite honestly right because like if this guy's off the board, this guy's off the board, then the decisions become a little bit easier, especially at the top of the draft. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's always very interesting to kind of go through those mock drafts. And I, I had a, a producer for another show I was on, like texting me and said, this mock draft is terrible. And I was like, why? He's like, well, none of this would ever happen. It's like, no, it it absolutely might happen. You don't yeah. think it will, but it absolutely might because of how NFL teams use certain players and certain things happen. So uh, that's why this process, this speculative process is so fun because literally like every opportunity is on the table. Yeah, and I think it's hard to do this at a really high level when you're operating at a high level. And I mean, I mean those high level differently, right? Like to do this well when you're operating up here versus like we're obviously more locked in on the commanders than any national person could be. Yeah. Um, by the same token, like, you know, we, we were talking about alt being mocked to, to Tennessee and he's most people's best lineman. So people just plug the need in the player. And you're like, I don't know that he's Bill Callahan's type of offensive yeah. lineman necessarily. Like, is that, is that the Callahan guy? And, you know, I think of, uh, like back early, the first draft, uh, podcast we did this cycle was with Matt Miller. And he said, you know, uh, Olu Fashanu, I think, is one of the elite players in this draft. And I don't know how Matt's evolved. I haven't checked his rankings recently on through that. But, like, maybe that's where Callahan was and is, and as in Bill. And if John Robinson, uh, I think, is the GM there um, in Tennessee, feels the same way, like, is Fashanu the first tackle on the board, off yeah. the board? Something that feels crazy if you just read national media mocks, but all it takes is one team. And that's kind yeah. of the fun, I think, of all of this is, they're looking for scheme fits. They're looking for personality fits. They're looking for medical information. They're looking at a lot of different stuff and a level of detail that only matters to them. 
and they don't care about the national whatever other than making sure they get good value because if you like a player more than others and you could trade down, well, then you have, you know, you get into the risk tolerance and what kind of deal can you get? And yeah. that's when it gets fun, Logan. That's when it yeah. gets fun. I mean, I even think it could go as far as like to say that the Tennessee Titans, and I, I don't know, I don't have any insider information. I'm just basing off guys that I've seen build drafts and seen build, like they might even go Talisi Fuaga or Troy Fontenot. That's yeah. like over both those guys. And I think because I, right. I think stylistically, athletically, they fit. And from a toughness standpoint, they really fit with what Bill likes and what Bill prides himself on. And so like that, that's kind of that what I'm talking about. It's not even Olu Fushano versus Joe Walt. It's like right. some of these yeah, other guys. I was just naming a guy. Yeah. But it's like, I think that's why it's so crazy. Cause I, you know, again, I talked to my NFL buddies and I think I said this on one of the shows I did, probably this one. And it's like, yeah, you did earlier in the week. The, you would be blown away. You're like, this is your number one receiver. It's like, yeah, I love this guy. And you're like, so would you take him in the first round? They're like, absolutely. And you're like, that seems absolutely bonkers, but like that's that's how they've evaluated it for whatever reason. That's what they've come to. So and sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. You know, yeah. there's all the wrong ones come to mind. You know, you take like a Mitchell Trubisky, and it's like that probably wasn't a good use the second <laughs> overall pick. But I remember I was in Dallas when they drafted Travis Frederick. And universally panned. Mel Kuyper's like, this is the worst pick in the draft. I didn't have, a, I had a third round grade on him. Dude's going to go to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Like, Cowboys won that one. Uh, yeah. You win some, you lose some. That is the nature of it. Um, but you just try to refine your process every year. And it's uh, it's a lot of fun. And we've certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and get to now run our thoughts by one of the best minds talking about football on television. Mina Kimes joins us next on Take Command. Our guest today is the freshly Emmy-nominated co-host of NFL Live, uh, ESPN NFL analyst Mina Kimes, also, of course, host of the Mina Kimes Show featuring Lenny. Uh, Mina, thanks so much for doing this. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. Fun, fun and interesting time to talk about the Washington football team. Yes. Uh, <laughs> although it, interesting for a different way than we're used to, which honestly, thank God. <laughs> Uh, it, is, it has been a wild couple of years, but um, what we wanted to have you on because we're big fans of what you're doing with the War Room concept on your your show, and I think it's really fun to kind of just like put that pressure on in the moment. So we, f we thought we'd start with a couple of the teams there, but obviously spend a little bit more time, undue time, if you will, uh, on Washington, or I guess it would be undue time if this wasn't ultimately supposed to be a Commander's podcast. Um, so with one, obviously it's Caleb Williams. We know that, and, and thus yeah. we can skip it, but... When you, for you, you've put Drake May up there for folks. You put Jaden Daniels up there for folks. I don't know if you put a JJ McCarthy up for for anybody to select from. I um, have not. <laughs> I have not. But done that. yeah. But you did put a, a pretty interesting trade up for Chris Sims this week on the most recent version with that Minnesota, uh, you know, eleven twenty three and basically every second round pick that they are allowed to offer. So we let's take the trade off the table for a second and just the the two that you have at the top. If I put you on the clock and say, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, who's your pick for Washington at two? Yeah, my pick is Drake May, which uh, going into this whole draft season, I thought was going to be the consensus. Turned out it's far from the consensus. In fact, you've got Jane Daniels now um, being picked to go first overall by some analysts. Not, not going to happen, but uh, some of my colleagues uh, like him better than Caleb Williams. Um, but for me, it's May um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I think the biggest one is I just think the traits at this point, when you look around the NFL and you see the quarterbacks like Mahomes, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, uh, just that common thread of the unbelievable arm talent with the second reaction ability is something that I see in May, which isn't to say he, he's going to be any of them, but um, I think he's very unique in that way. Um, I also think at North Carolina, he faced a ton of adversity this season, really difficult situation, uh, lapses in pass protection, uh, vastly inferior weapons, of course, to Daniels. And I think that explains a lot of the uh, issues at time you saw on tape. So I like his upside a lot. Um, you know, uh, it might take him a second to sort of reach the ceiling, but I think because of how high the ceiling is, I would take him second overall. Is there any reservation about some of the like technical stuff you see on tape? Obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, with like, um, footwork, the drops, kind of the inaccuracies, like, and you, you mentioned, like, I think I, I would be in total agreement with you, right? It's a, extremely imp important to like acknowledge his ceiling is probably the highest of him in the class outside of Caleb Williams, but like, is he going to get there? Right. You know, Allen, they kind of sat with him for three years, you know, Mahomes got to sit all these guys with all these kind of tools that need developmental periods. 
made it happen. Is Washington in a position where they can make that happen? And do you think you can get there? It's a great question about Washington being in the position to start with. And you mentioning that some of those like toolsier raw quarterbacks having time or, you know, in the case of like Allen, like a really good situation in Buffalo where it actually took Josh Allen two years to really become Josh Allen. Uh, you know, they go out, they build, they trade for Stephon Diggs, for example. Um, and I think with Washington, it's a good question because while Washington has the skill players, the offensive line is a huge, huge question mark, even with some of the additions that they made in free agency. Um, that said, I don't think, um, like I don't see May as a prospect where issues in pass protection, I think would um, affect him necessarily. Uh, like, you know, the, the whole David Carr example. Um, to me, it would more be about coaching and scheme. And actually that's probably the bigger question I have is Cliff Kingsbury also more than the uh, personnel around him. Is he the right play caller to develop him? I do like the fact that there's Cliff Kingsbury, the, the play caller, and then there's Cliff Kingsbury, the developer of quarterbacks. And I think actually it's that second part that I'm maybe more confident in. And I have, I, I like the fit more from that perspective because to your point, there is some mechanical stuff that needs to be cleaned up. Yeah. Um, it, it's every time you feel like you make a decision, we're just like, all right, the guy that we like is this. And the minute that name comes out of your mouth, you're like, ah, oh, but you're passing up over here. And I, I think it's also like a patience thing. Um, yeah. You know, Washington fans have been waiting for so long. And so for some of them, they look at the Marcus Mariota side and they're like, that dude can't play. You have to take Jaden Daniels. <laughs> like what's your kind of your, your, as you've looked at this longitudinally over the years, the tolerance for teams to wait Actually, and have the patience, yeah, yeah, versus no. he's the playing out. We're kind of like years to play. Let's be real. And, but but and I, like, I think the Allen example yeah. is good though because like he both sat and played at the same time. Like they insulated yeah. him in a way that worked. And he played pretty quickly. I mean, everybody plays. The only guys who don't play are like. Jordan Love, because you have Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes. People forget how freaking good Alex Smith was. That final, like Alex Smith, was, this is like one of my big pet peeves is the retconning of like Alex Smith's career. Alex Smith's <laughs> final year in Kansas City was extremely good. Like that offense was excellent. And he was yeah. also pushing the ball downfield. Um, so usually, you know, when you look at these guys who have sat and it, the, the willingness of teams to sit him, it's not really about the rawness of the quarterback, although I certainly think that helped Jordan Love, you know, getting a chance, sort of especially because of the college situation he was coming from. But rather, it's about the quarterback who's playing ahead of them. And a team like Washington, I think Marcus Mariota is a perfectly serviceable backup quarterback. Whoever you draft will play. He will play. It is not, it, New England, I think, is actually uh, a situation where you actually might see a quarterback sitting because I think Brissett, you guys saw in, in limited uh, exposure, is like probably one of the best quarterback backup quarterbacks in the entire NFL, in my opinion. Yep. So, uh, But I think with Washington, whoever you draft, you're going to get out on the field quickly, um, honestly, for better or worse. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting observation because I do think that uh, there are ways to insulate a quarterback. I think Joe Flacco, Ben Roethlisberger, Russell Wilson, kind of this defense first rushing attack approach, which I think could be implemented here. And I think it goes back to your point about Cliff kind of, you know, the developer of quarterbacks and how they insulate him. Is there I, my, my one question coming out of this conversation, because I think I agree with everything you said, is why no, not why not JJ? Why is he not in this conversation for you? Yeah, I, I do like JJ. And the more I watched him, the more I got it. Right. Especially when you look at him through the lens of some of the, I would say, the predominant scheme in today's NFL, the Shanahan offenses. You look at him, it's so easy to imagine him slotting into one of those offenses. It's easy to see why those coaches would privilege his skill set. He's accurate. He throws over the middle of the field, which not all the quarterback prospects do in this draft. Um, he is athletic. Uh, and so I get it. It makes sense. However, there are questions for me. Um, I think his arm talent is not up to it, it, Let's just compare him to May, for example, um, who seems to be kind of the faller and JJ's the riser. Who knows how much of that is real? Uh, obviously, uh, Drake May is bigger. And I think, you know, the tools are there. The arm talent to me is more impressive. You don't see that same sort of out of structure playmaking with JJ uh, consistently that you see with Drake May. You see a little bit. He throws on the run really well. Again, I like him as like a boot quarterback, but um so there's that. And then, you know, uh, as far as like the throws go, he is accurate. Um, there aren't that to me that many touch throws on tape. It's a lot of line drives. Um, so I think I have questions too about sort of ability there compared to, again, the top three quarterbacks. So I think you see that all with them on their tape. Um, and, and then, yeah, some of it is just sample size straight up. Like, you know, the, the guy wasn't asked to do a lot. A lot of that was because of the offense. And I think there's a bit of projection going on that I get, I get why that's alluring. Right. Um, 
Coach is always like the unknown, but for me, it raises questions. Yeah, it's funny because I think Logan and I both have had the same thing, but we also have had to check our biases big time with JJ because it looks like, as you said, the predominant system, which he played in and I've covered the my entirety of my career. Um, and, and he played in for almost the entirety of his career. Um, so it's like, oh yeah, that looks like NFL. That's the, the NFL we know. And so it's... Well, it's the hard. offense is an NFL offense. Yeah. You're watching right. a guy run it. I mean, so much like I was just, we were on NFL Live talking about Bo Nix and I was like, dude, I don't know. I mean, I, like, I, I, yeah, it's like RPOs and screens right. and what and guys wide open off of like, yeah, it's so college Whereas when you watch JJ McCarthy, it looks like he's under yeah. center, he's booting, like it, you, you see it. So I think it's, it's just a lot easier. And then I think with the success of like Brock Purdy and he's kind of like, okay, maybe it could be Purdy plus, you know, um, right. you see why coaches like it. It's the same reason why Kirk Cousins just got four years, $180 million, you know, it's like, right. hundred percent. get it. So if we go back to the war room scenario and I say, yeah. okay, May's your guy. But I'm going to offer you the same Minnesota deal that you offered Chris Sims on your show. Would you still just take May or would you have interest with where Washington is uh, in that Minnesota trade back? I'm taking May. I think Washington has enough talent to where it's not like, oh, my God, this team is a disaster and there's so many holes. I mean, there's some pretty market holes at pretty premium positions, no doubt, on this roster. But I think because you already have really good wide receivers, um, you have really good interior defensive line. There, there's still, you have enough talent to where I don't feel like it's a total tear down and where the, the quarterback is being put in an awful, like an untenable position to succeed. I also think at a certain point, it's like, you got it. You need a quarterback, right? And if you're a team that's kind of been waiting through it for a while, I think you just kind of hit a wall with it where you're like, all right, we got to take a quarterback. We got to, and the, you have a chance to get a really good one. Yeah. Awesome. And so then I guess, um, yeah, I don't know. What's the next pick we got, Craig? We got like a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, we could, we could, if you want to talk about untenable, we can go to New England. We can just go to three and, uh, the, the situation there. But I think that, like, you know, we talk about these inflection points in the draft and where this thing flips. And I, I think really the next, I mean, three, obviously, whether New England sits or trades back, that's an inflection point because that shapes depending, you know, where the yeah. quarterbacks go, how desperate teams get. Arizona, same thing. LA, same thing. New York, like, is a quarterback there for them? Do they get aggressive and go up? Like, I, I really feel like every pick, I mean, even seven at Tennessee is a really, like, low-key interesting one to me. Like, I, I feel like the draft could just veer off in a bunch of different directions at any one of those picks. I think you could see teams trading up to, like you said, every spot from three through nine, which is wild. But not just because of the quarterback factor. So at three, four, five whatever team wants either QB3 or JJ McCarthy, maybe even higher, whatever, you're suddenly looking at, okay, any of those teams, Minnesota, Las Vegas, Denver, could potentially trade up. But I'll say this too, like the wide receivers, the top three wide receivers in this draft, uh, Harrison Jr., Odunze, and Neighbors, are so good and so universally thought of that way that I wouldn't be surprised if you might see a surprise trade up to seven, eight, nine from one of those receivers too, which is crazy because that so rarely happens. So let me, yeah. let me flip this question to both of you then. Like if you're one of those teams, any team between three and nine, so that is New England, Arizona, LA, the Giants, Tennessee, Atlanta, Chicago, uh, for those that don't have a draft board in front of them at home, which of those teams most wants to trade back? Like who, who benefits the most from getting out of that range, whether because the player that they like is is probably better taken later. They need to get multiple picks. Uh, Mina, start with you. Like who, who wants to get yeah. out of there the most? So originally I thought the Cardinals are the obvious one because that roster has more needs than positions of stability, frankly. Like you look at that roster, you're feeling good about offensive tackle, tight end, McBride, safety. That's it. A quarterback right so but they do have an extra first from the uh, texans trade last year and then an extra third round pick so they have a ton of draft capital and increasingly i'm like ah at a certain point you can't i know their their, their gm likes to trade money also but like a certain point you just take marvin harrison jr man like that's what i would do honestly i get the it it, it makes sense um but i just think you know you got enough picks and you got to start building a roster with really like your core players uh, the Chargers, to me, are the team that I, I, I would trade down if I were them, frankly, because that's an, I think it, it has been a highly overrated roster now for several years, um, and suddenly you're looking at it, and you're just so many positions of need. 
Um, so while taking one of those wide receivers would be really tempting or offensive tackle, they've been linked with Joe Alt a lot. I would really consider taking a haul if it's available to them. Yeah, I totally agree. I think stylistically, like who Harbaugh wants to be, I don't think there's a player there in that in that kind of range that you feel really good about. I think Joe Alt's a guy that gets a lot of love, but I think he's a little bit more developmental than people want to think. I think Olu Fashano is kind of a lot of people's too. I don't think he's physical enough, quite frankly, for what Harbaugh wants to be. That's so great. I think you're kind of in that J.C. Latham, Troy Fontenot, Marius Mims kind of range, and I could easily train down to 11 and probably yeah. get one of those guys there. Yeah. Uh, Talisi Fuaga is the other guy. So I just think stylistically, uh, the culture they're trying to build there, you're looking for a big mauling right tackle that can block gap scheme runs and be aggressive. So why why not get some money in return for the player that you really want, which is later in the draft? Yeah. Totally agree. Uh, so that brings us then to seven and eight, Tennessee and Atlanta which have been like, at this point feels like a joke. It's like, okay, it's Tennessee, pencil and yeah. all Atlanta, pencil and Turner, which do you think is less likely to actually happen that way? It's such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I asked the good question, Logan. I'm so sorry. We've been doing this podcast for two years. I, I haven't know, asked you a single good. one. The meat has been and here that, for 10 minutes. And I've, here we are. I've done this war room draft now four times and every single time it's gone all yep. turn or, you know, yep. I, and it's just, I think it'll be really hard though for uh, at both those teams to turn down the t the big three receivers. But it's so obviously not what they should do. So I think that the more the more likely outcome to to give to I guess throw a little bit of a curveball would be Tennessee trading down and someone else jumping uh, the Jets and the Bears to get like Odunze because Tennessee thinks to Logan's point we can get one of those offensive tackles a little bit later. That would be the more likely outcome. Yeah, and I was going to say, like, Tennessee, to me, like, knowing Bill Callahan and knowing stylistically, like, who he wants to be, they want to run a lot of duo, want to get the ball downhill. Like, again, both those players don't really fit, like, from a cultural standpoint. The, I mean, the one that gets me, and I think you've talked about this on your show, Mina, is the Atlanta one with Dallas Turner. Like, when I watched the tape of Dallas Turner, I'm like – the guy to me is Layatu Latu, like is a pass rusher. And I know there's the medical stuff. I know there's the stuff. But like if I want 10 sacks next year, the guy I'm drafting is the kid from UCLA. Like I'm not going in on this like uh, trait C. Again, the traits are important, no doubt. Oh, no, but you're I want right. to get, you, get your thoughts on it. You're, this is a head heart thing for me because my heart, it, like I like Latu's tape better. I mean, he's yeah. so freaking polished as a pass rusher. And it's so – and I and – I, it's so easy for me to imagine him being productive in the NFL immediately, but I try to put on my GM hat when I think about it. And it's like, the, obviously the injuries are real and then it's something you have to consider. But then like, you know, with these pass rushers, you do the traits and the length and the athleticism and all of that and the size and, and all of it does. I mean, Latu's athletic though. It's not like he's, he, he's not, un, not athletic, but um, yeah, I, I have, I have questioned the fact that I have Turner in chalk there. He does have a lot I like, you know, I think no doubt. more explosive, for example, but you do wonder, you're like, okay, well, like, where's the production? You know, is this the production of a top 10 pick? <laughs> and we have seen in recent years, by the way, like the traits here, edge rushers have struggled in the NFL. Yeah. You think about Walker in Jacksonville. Um, so I, I, I have been wrestling with this as well. And this is something it's almost like Atlanta. It's, it's like not, it's kind of a curse for them to pick at eight and maybe they're a trade down because <laughs> no, because it does feel too high, right. To take yeah. the three years in a row that they've, they've been at eight. So like literally they are cursed. That's, that's, and it's, and this is the year, by the way, more than any of those other years where actually you do want to take a skill player at eight and they don't need a skill player because of the way they've drafted. Right. So it's like kind of weirdly the board is not perfect for them because yeah so maybe they're more of a trade down team actually as we talk this through the other thing i wanted to ask you is obviously we talked edge rusher there is is the best defensive player an edge rusher or is it a corner or is it a interior defensive player because I, I think like i look at you know quinion mitchell and I, he's my highest rated corner yeah. and from a trade standpoint from a reduction standpoint maybe it fits that bill a little bit more acutely or there's Byron Murphy, who, again, like there's issues there in terms of total production. He's on the ground a little bit more than you like. But in terms of upside, he's like Grady Jarrett's clone. And they have yeah. a lot of success with undersized interior players. So I think Murphy's the best defensive player, to answer your question. Um, Look at this. Look at this. Look at yeah, that. That's kind of where I landed. Yeah, I, I, I um, just like all around, like we think, I don't know. I, I think he probably has the highest floor and the highest ceiling to me. Mm. Um, but just because of positional value, I have a go a little bit later. Mm. We'll 
see though. Well, I don't know. But wait, say that again. Well, like oh, we just saw all these defensive tackles get paid twenty million yeah, bucks. Sorry. When I say I meant not positional value, um, needs rather more. Needs, so like I got you. At the I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're about no. to fight on the show. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's a good time to be a defensive tackle. Yeah, and I think. Um, you know, uh, him and Newton, who's the other three tech that keeps getting kind of pushed up boards. Like, I think um, you have to take that in consideration if you're a team picking in the in the middle, like your Seahawks at 16, the Seahawks at 16 is the kind of the team, but the Rams at 19 are the other obvious thing. Like, it's now, I mean, positional, this is where, like, positional value does help. Like, yeah, there's actually a huge benefit to getting a penetrating three tech on a rookie deal for four years. Um, and it's why, like, you know, like, I like, Bowers could be the faller where a guy like that might rise. Well, so that's actually where I wanted to go next. If we want to get into a fight, we can talk about tight ends, Logan. Well, you yeah, know nothing about that let's position. Let's talk about so, that. You know, yeah. only played it for 10 years. Uh, not like Brock Bowers did, that's for sure. No, that's for sure. One of my favorite moments uh, that happens in all four of your mock, uh, your, your mocks, uh, Mina, with, with your guests in the war room is you offer them Brock Bowers at 10. They really want to take him, and then yeah. they go offensive line. If you have that choice, uh, p- pick your offensive lineman versus Brock Bowers. Would you take Brock Bowers, or would you go with them? This is why I feel like the worm exercise is really useful because this is—I I guarantee you—so many GMs will have to be physically restrained from drafting Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers, blah. like, or coaches rather are going to be like offensive coordinators and be like, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, and GM or Aaron Rodgers crashing like, the. The draft room. Well, that's because- the first inflection point for Bowers, right? Is pick ten yeah. with, and that, and that's an interesting one because they're such a unique team because their timeline is so, they are so obviously win now, um, and but the thing is, uh, offensive tackle for them, you could argue, is both a win now and a win long term move for the Jets because of the, um, you know, the age of the offensive tackles that they brought in Smith and Moses. Um, and yeah, it's tricky. So like we just talked about this on the latest uh, episode of my podcast, the the value thing with Bowers. So um, you guys know this, but obviously, you know, just for listeners, obviously one of the biggest benefits of getting a guy on a rookie contract is the money savings. Uh, pick 10, you're making about $5 million a year, right? Which is an incredible savings if you get a top wide receiver like a Garrett Wilson in New York, for example, uh, because they make in the 20 millions. Whereas if you get an amazing tight end at that position, you're not actually saving that much money. So the bar for that tight end is higher. And Logan, I, I mean, you agree with like, this is, yeah. those are just the facts. That said, <laughs> Brock Bowers might be that tight end because he's yeah, right. as good of a prospect at the position that I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. How does he compare to Pitts for you? So for me, I think Pitts was a really unique evaluation because I felt like his length and his size allowed him to compete in line in a way that I'd never seen a tight end do before. Like he could be your true X receiver. He could beat a number one corner and then he could block a six technique and he could pass pro. And I think like that diversity made me so confident in his evaluation that he was going to be good because you couldn't screw it up. Right. And then Atlanta screwed it up because they just played him at X the whole time. And it was like all this flexibility that he gives your offense is there. Brock Bowers is unique to me because I, his, his yards after the catch ability is tremendous. Like the way he runs routes is very Travis Kelsey-esque in terms of how he feels zone. Awesome. He competes in line, but he can't win consistently versus big defensive linemen. So you need to have conceptually as an offensive coordinator, a vision and an identity for how to maximize that ability. So to me, I just said, screw it. I'm just going to evaluate him like a receiver. And if you evaluate him like a receiver, like he's the he's the fourth guy for me, right? Like he's like him and Brian Thomas Jr. are kind of yeah. neck and neck. And so in this offense here, in the Jets who need to win right now, Aaron Rodgers, like I want playmakers, I want weapons. And I think Elijah Vera Tucker on the inside gives you a lot of flexibility to say, hey man, if one of these tackles get hurt, so we can add some interior depth there. A guy like, you know, Christian Haynes from UConn, he can plug in at guard. We can move Vera Tucker to tackle. And I just don't think in this class specifically, there's an offensive playmaker like this that works the middle of the field the way he does. And I just think about Aaron Rodgers throwing to like Jermichael Finley back in the day in Green Bay and how he was able to maximize that group. And in, a, in and for a group that you mentioned that has a crazy timetable, I'm like, let's score a ton of points and let's <laughs> let our quarterback deal is what I'm thinking here. So, Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I like what you said about too, like how you have him almost as the fourth wide receiver because I do, I, I like if you're just ranking weapons, he, yeah. would, he would be four right. for me as well. He's above Thomas Jr., he does more things for your offense than Thomas Jr. I see him actually, yeah. Um, if I was an offensive coordinator, I would rather have Brock Bowers because of what that you can do with you know formations and personnel groupings and whatnot. So, 
you know, when you think about it from that point of view, it makes a lot of sense. The team that I actually keep um, suggesting him for is Indianapolis at 15. <laughs> um, no, laughing? No, no, no that's, like a very, it, that's a very popular one, you know, because like um, it fits like with yeah. what they – but it's just funny because they go out every year – and they get a crazy traitsy tight end, and then they're just this like the third year in a row they're gonna have a really crazy traitsy tight end who's good at football. So, but who's and that, yeah, like a more polished though. And, but yeah. I also feel like in that offense, the one thing that inhibits you in an Indy, we're getting off on a on a tangent here, is that they have no vertical speed in that offense, really, right? You don't think Alex, Alex Pierce? Pe Alec Pierce runs a four four, but I think his ability to consistently catch the football inhibits the effectiveness yeah. of that threat, right? So and I his think defense. The, Look at the people who have been throwing him deep balls. No, yeah. no, no. And again, like I like him as a prospect. I like, I like him as a player. But I think if you could get a more productive vertical element to your passing game, I think that magnifies what – what yeah. Pittman so that, does. That's that, your Brian Thomas Jr. spot then. Yeah. So for me, that's kind of the way I would look at that. You know, yeah. if there's this vertical pass, ca pass catcher there, like speed is fine. Be fast. Let's open this up, especially if you got a quarterback who's running the ball the way that Anthony Richards is going to run it. Why not? You know what I mean? So. Yeah. And I guess you got down. I, I totally forgot about Downs too, who's, who actually was pretty good for them year one yeah. um, and has good hands and he's more of your slot guy. So you have somebody to work underneath. You have Micah Pittman working that 10 to 20 yard range. And then if you throw in, yeah, that is actually a nice group now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I think I would like either of those picks. My preference is for them to go offense though, because I keep seeing corners mock to them. They obviously need to yeah. but like, I feel like uh, we, we talk all about, Oh my God, Bryce Young needs help. Well, what about Anthony Richardson, man? Like <laughs> cause they, he needs to, they need an eval, like a real eval on him year two. And my feeling is they still need to add uh, to that group of skill players. All right. Go. A couple more uh, inflection points slash uh, questions here. Uh, 11, currently Minnesota. Everyone thinks they're going to trade up, but currently 11, 12, 13, Denver, Las Vegas. All teams targeting quarterbacks, all trying to trade up. Which of those three teams is least likely to come out of this draft with a quarterback in the first round? They're all going to take one somewhere, but like they don't take Knicks, Penix, McCarthy, uh, or they don't trade up to to get uh, one of the top guys. I think the Raiders. I think least um, likely, least likely, yeah, least likely. Yeah. I think it's more likely that the Raiders sit, wait, take Penix later. And the Broncos, I feel there's like Peyton, I think probably has more influence on the draft process than I'm guessing Antonio Pierce does. And I can't imagine he'll go into this season without another option at quarterback. Maybe but he's, he's done that before though, right? He's, he's yeah. gotten into a year starting Jared Stidham, right? Like that happened. Am I m m imagining that? Like, I think that's, uh, that's you telling it, the future. <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm just saying, like, was, yeah. We well, mean, <clears throat> you mean like, yes, when, yes, yes. Breeze was injured, or yeah. I yeah. mean, or even before. Yeah, I, I think uh, if he really likes Stidham, maybe then maybe they'd be more comfortable with it. Seems but, crazy though. I don't know, but uh, man, I. I to me, though, I, I think more likely than not, both of those teams wait till later rounds. I mean, the you know the track record of quarterbacks drafted after fifteen is just not good, or after even ten is not good. So, well, I got a question for you on Penix. Like, what is your what's your read on him? You know, because I know like uh, Sims you had on your podcast is very very high on him. He's always high on like traitsy types of players, and he fits yeah. that bill. Like, is he a value? Like, is he a first round player in your evaluation? Or do you think he's going to be there in the second round when some of these teams need quarterbacks? I think he'll be there in the second round. Mm -hmm. I do. I think we like in our community probably undervalue how much teams care about age and injury history, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, it's really, I mean, that is, I was just talking to my friend Bomani Jones and he said, the Carfax is not great. <laughs> 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 so true. It really is like, oh my God, when you, just take take a step back and look at the injuries. They are really something. And um, you know, I keep people keep saying, "Well, if he wasn't injured, he wasn't 24." I'm like, "Well, he is." Like, so right. by the way, Bo Nix cool too. Um, and I'm a UW fan, so you know, I uh, I'd, I've I've loved watching Michael Penix Jr. I think he's so inspiring as a human. His arm talent is awesome, but um, he's not a perfect prospect. Like, there, it's not just the age and the injury history. There are a lot of games where he would kind of spray it some of his mechanics are a little odd to me um didn't throw a ton over the middle of the field uh and pressure mitigation like he doesn't move that great um there are games where you saw better versions of that though uh and i do think in the right situation he could be a productive starter but i think that situation um 
has to be pretty specific. So I think there's like, a, I, I view him as like very context dependent. And I think there's a lot of teams where it probably wouldn't work. Mm. All right. Last thing for you, Mina, on the way out here, um, Logan and I, when we've done our mocks so far, we we've kind of tried to make it so, okay, we'll let the computer sim some stuff and we can pick at 36 and 40 for Washington. Cause those are two obviously huge picks as well. Oh. So is there, is there a player? I'm not, I'm not going to make no, you stretch no, 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 your first no. round this, knowledge. We're gonna, this is a good question. There we go. Yeah. So I'm not going to make you stretch in a second round, but as you've done these mock drafts, whether it's the, the war room or any other mock draft that you've done, obviously you've been talking about uh, all your colleagues on ESPNs, their mocks, et cetera. Is there a guy that has fallen into the late first round that Ooh. you think for Washington at tackle, I'm going to say tackle corner receiver would be worth trading up for. I for know Washington. I'm looking at the Washington depth chart right now. Um, I think tackle is probably the position where you're most likely to get an alignment of value and need there. Um, I, th I think like Mims is a fascinating one because he could go in the top 10 and he could fall to the twenties. I think if he falls to the twenties, I would run. Uh, yeah, out of the, out of Georgia. I think we all would. We'd all yeah. probably probably not as fast as him, but we try to get there. Yeah, <laughs> that, I mean that big fella can move. Um, so that <laughs> is one that I really love there. Um, corner is interesting actually because when I'm doing these drafts, actually I'm seeing the corners fall. Um, like uh, I, you know, Ar Arnold and uh, Mitchell keep going pretty in the top. Have pretty consistently been going in the top twenty or so, but. Um, uh, Wiggins and Jean have fallen in some of my mocks. Uh, very, very different corners, by the way. Um, and now that I think about it, I'm trying to think of like who would be a better fit for Quinn and his defense, assuming that it's going to there's going to be some. God, I feel like with Forbes, you can't draft Wiggins. <laughs> you can't draft another skinny guy. Um, so well, maybe do you think Dejean can play outside? Like, I mean, that's a question that I keep coming back to when I watch the film. Yeah, it's like, I know. like he's, yeah. he's a heck of a ball player. Like he's a good football player as a nickel safety, that guy, like kind of your honey badger guy. But like yeah. we got a bunch of guys like that. We need like yeah, an outside corner. They just drafted corner. Quan Martin. I know. They had actually, Jeremy Chin. I forgot. Yeah, right. You had a Luvu and Chin, and you got all these like yeah. So in some ways, his skill set is a little bit redundant for you. You really need an outside corner. I like Wiggins more than McKinstry, and I guess Rick Straw is being mocked there. So that would be my pick. But I think the size thing. I I don't know if if I'm Washington, if I'm a little scared off of that given. Forbes, I like Forbes too as a prospect. It surprised me where they picked him. I uh, hopefully he's better in year two, but I, I have to think that the size thing might scare them off of Wiggins. Yeah, like the other tackle. thing I wanted, to, the other thing I wanted to ask is like, do you think like what do you think it would take? And this is totally like I know out of left field, but like going from thirty six and forty because I feel like you got to get above like twenty one maybe for like a tackle because I think you get in that kind of meat of that round there where it's like yeah. Pittsburgh, Miami, I forget the other teams. There's like four or five teams that were like, right. you could all reasonably pick an offensive lineman. Is that a reasonable expectation or you just hope that someone kind of slips past that that tackle valley there? Yeah, I think I, that's a really good point. I think a lot of it is going to be if, if things start shaking out, let's say the Jets go tackle instead of you know taking mm. Bowers or whatnot, and then all of a sudden you start seeing these tackles come off the board, I do think it has to be something – that Washington is open to um, because, and again, like I, I guess we talked, I said this at the very top, like we keep talking about the Patriots and how bad that situation is. Look, Washington's situation is not as bad because you have the receivers, but the offensive line is not great. And you're bringing in a rookie quarterback. So I would prioritize that position. Like you have to come out of this draft upgrading at that. And if it, to your point, takes a move because of the way the board is shaking out, I think it's worth it. Um, mm. Especially since you don't have to, unlike everyone else, you don't have to move for quarterback. Right. You got six in the top 100. Let's make it five, but you can wind up with the first round uh, left tackle of the future. Sounds good to me. That's that's math I could do. And if anyone is a regular listener to the show, uh, math I could do is a very small amount. Very, very small amount. Uh, Mina Kimes, uh, watch her on NFL Live, uh, the Mina Kimes show featuring Lenny. Uh, Mina, again, congrats on the Emmy nomination. That is oh, fantastic. Very well deserved. And uh, thanks for joining us here on Take Command. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, if, if anyone is listening to this who's a Commanders fan, I get guessing that's 99.9% .9 of listeners. You never know. Who knows who, who you might bring to our uh, pod? Well, uh, yes, uh, 
check out our show. Uh, we're on YouTube at Mina Kimes. A lot of commanders talk right now. <laughs> uh, it's so funny. I just did uh, Bill Simmons' show, and he kept talking about like Drake Mayer, Daniels, the Patriots, and I, and I was like, Bill, you realize that's not your choice. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> free, Bill. It's, it's the commanders' choice. So y'all are in. You're in the catbird seat. It's a very exciting time to be a commanders fan. I'd be pumped. And in, indeed, uh, it's going to be a fun couple of weeks. Mina, thanks again for coming on. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs>